I'd like to welcome you to Beyond the Screen, Film and Television as Social Agent. Our guest speakers are Christy Marchisi, Shail Jakejriwal, Andy Whitaker, Hind Bensari, and our moderator is Dorothy Venner. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. Um, I am very happy to have the honor of uh, chairing this, this panel. T Films and TV as social change agents is our topic. And we have a very, very prolific uh, panel here. And I think in this case, with this particular topic, it is of utmost relevance to have people who share their experiences of what went very well, but also what went wrong. So yesterday in our prep meeting, we decided we will go by cases because we believe that uh, learning from things that went well is as inspiring as it might be useful for you as filmmakers, producers and people active in the industry to learn from things that went not so very well. Uh, to look at what TV is in the center of our media world as we are talking about it today also a medium that has special relationship when it comes to social change, to festivals, to documentary filmmaking, but also, of course, to social media, partly to print, radio, so this is what we are going to discuss. And I would like to start with uh, a little thought before I'm inviting our guests to share their experiences on particular stories. Um, when we are looking at today's uh, most relevant topic politically that drives everyone around, uh, we can see that um, case studies are being done on how ISIS is influencing politics, minds, and recruiting new people. And uh, there is one uh, scientist in, in Spain who has done a media analysis of ISIS video, via videos that are published in the internet, and he is actually looking at how similar, for instance, uh, the film ISIS Sniper, a very, very successful film, was imitating or copying even American Sniper. Hunger Games is another film that was highly influential to the aesthetics and to the narratives of films that are made to provoke social change in a way that I would think none of us would promote. So we are sitting here trying to also look at ways of how we can use uh, films, film, filmic means, methods, uh, to promote social, social change in a different way. Our guests have very different backgrounds. They bring with them very different stories, different topics, and different experience, experiences from also various geographical backgrounds. And I think we just delve right into matter, and maybe Christy would be so kind to open up um, this um, round of cases. She's the founder and CEO of Picture Motion. Um, that is a company that does marketing. Now, marketing is something that we know when we talk about huge Hollywood um, um, films that would, in, that would develop uh, little gadgets and that would be very costly advertisement parties and celebrity interviews. Social marketing or marketing of documentaries and features that promote social change is a completely different matter. So, Christy, if you would start uh, talking about the one story that we start with in the beginning um, from your background so that we get to learn what actually you're doing and what you think went very well. Sure. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, the way we kind of talk about our work, just to give a little bit more background, is we do uh, social action and, mark and grassroots marketing. We, most of the documentary films we work on don't have the Iron Man or uh, budget. <laughs> so this, we have to get really creative in how we're going to find our audiences and connect with them. And so we'll, we'll sit down with filmmakers and first really hash out what that strategy is and what their goals are. Are we trying to find an audience for the film? Are we just trying to get people to buy tickets? Do we want them to watch it online? Which is very, very important. We, oh, I forgot to turn off my phone. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, or are we doing the social impact strategy? And it's slightly different. Um, 
if we're doing marketing, it's who are the most immediate audiences, who are the people we know want to see this film, and how do we make sure we reach them uh, so that they'll buy that ticket. For social impact or for social action, it's who are the people that have the power to create change. If we're talking about behavior change or consumer behavior, um, we want to reach the, the consumer directly. If it's about policy change, maybe we want to create a campaign that will reach our legislators. Um, so it's, it's really sitting down and kind of hashing out what are our goals. So to give an example, we worked on a film uh, for about two years, starting about two, almost two years ago, called Fed Up. Uh, and Fed Up is a film produced by Lori David and uh, Katie Couric and directed by Stephanie Schodig. And <clears throat> the, film was a, the whole goal of the film was to educate people about how sugar is killing us and how our government and, our, and the big brands that we're all familiar with is, are complicit in hiding that information from us. And so when we sit down with the filmmakers, we kind of have a series of steps that we go through. Um, so first, it's the, the data collection, the surveying. Who have you talked to already? Who are your partners? Who are the, the information sources? Let's gather everything you already know about this film so we, we kind of know what the commitments might be. And then we sit down and really hash out the goals. What are your goals with this film? So for this, you know, the question we always ask filmmakers is, in two years from now, what do you want to look back and be able to say? And for some filmmakers, it's, I need to be able to pay back my producers or my investors. I want to win an Oscar. Um, and for some, it's, I really want to see change on this issue. We like to get that in writing because to, to the conversation later about what are mistakes that are made, when you're not on the same page, when your team's not on the same page, that's when mistakes are going to happen and that's where uh, unmet expectations are going to cause huge issues in your campaign. So for that film it was, one, we want to change how people eat and two, if possible, we want to change nutrition labels and how information is presented. So now we're looking at, okay, we've got all our information, we have our goals, who, uh, who do we have to work with, who do we have to reach, who are our audiences uh, to reach those goals? And normally on most of the films we work on, we try and find a very specific audience, but this one is everyone. The issue of sugar is affecting everybody. So then we had to kind of section out who the different audiences are. Okay, we gotta get to moms, we gotta get to kids in schools, we gotta get to foodies because they're very vocal about this. And then once you figure out who your audiences are, you can say who influences them, who do they listen to? So who are the celebrities that talk about food? Who are the celebrities that share recipes that maybe have too much sugar in it? And so then we kind of figure out who those influencers are and how we reach them. And then we get to the next step of developing this strategy, and that's the tactics. What are we doing? Now we know who we're trying to reach, we know who they listen to, now what does this actually look like? And for the film Fed Up, we created something called the Sugar Free Challenge. And for 10 days, you had to commit to going sugar free. And when you sign up, every day for 10 days, we give you tips, we give you recipes, we give you facts, we give you things to tweet. And you find out, it's, it's an experiential um, campaign where you find out just how hard it is. Um, and so that was like the main tactic we focused on. And then the next step in putting these campaigns together, and stop me from going on too long, <laughs> um, are what we call the KPIs, your key performance indicators. How do you know if you're doing well? How do you know if you're reaching your audience? How do you know if anyone's listening? And that's where we use a lot of digital tools, from email opt-ins to Twitter impressions uh, to press impressions, and we try and collect as much data as possible to see if we're making any progress. So for us, we got about 70,000 people to sign up for the challenge, and we checked our open rates, we checked our impressions, we reached hundreds of millions of people wish the, with the sugar-free challenge. And then the last part of this is the impact. So we saw we, people are engaged, they watched the film or they heard about it, they took action in some way with the sugar-free challenge. What was the actual impact? And for us, you know, we, this goes back to our goals. Do we change nutrition labels? We haven't yet, but we hope to eventually. But we did change consumer behavior, and we know this because the American Diabetes Association came out and said, of all the things in the last 10 years that has actually changed how Americans view sugar and interpret what they're eating, uh, the, fed up, the fed up film and its corresponding social media campaign has had a greater impact than anything we've done in the last few years. And that was based on their surveying and their own experience in this space. So that's kind of my, my long story <laughs> case study that hopefully I can kind of refer back to. Thank you very much, Chrissy. This is uh, a lot to learn from. <laughs> Yesterday when we were talking, she also shared things which didn't went that, that smoothly. And uh, we will come to that a little later. Um, Hin Benzari is a filmmaker, so she comes in from uh, the other side of filmmaking. Uh, her film, Break the Silence, in 2014, yesterday, made a huge impact. Uh, Hint was born in Casablanca, grew up in London, and this film is very much a film about um, a law in Tunisia. And I would like to, in... Um, uh, to, to invite him to tell us a little bit about the film, how you made it, and when did you start thinking about that this is a film that you really want to use to change the reality we are living in? 
Um, yes, uh, thanks for coming, everybody. So um, when I decided to, I decided to do this film to raise consciousness, and um, it had a, a stated objective to repeal an article of law in Morocco which allowed men accused of rape to avoid a jail sentence if they married their victims. So the idea was to say that a man is taking responsibility for his actions if he marries his victim. Um, and uh, a young girl named Amila Finali, who was a um, 16 year old at the time, killed herself after she was forced to marry her rapist. Um, and so that's when I decided to do a film. I said, okay, a young girl has died, many girls have died, but in the context of the Arab Spring and everything that was happening in Morocco, um, this type of story really caught on with, uh, with the public. And Morocco being, half of Morocco's population being illiterate, I thought the best way to act on this is to make an audiovisual piece that everyone can see and everyone can understand. Um, so my goal was really, was not to keep um, uh, the debate around um, rape victims and legal issues at the top level of governance and legislation, but really make the population more engaged and have something to say about that. Now, it all sounds great, um, you know, you, but once I actually dug into the whole subject, I realized that I was facing a lot of, um, a lot of um, um, contradictions and not, so many, not that many people were for the idea that a, a rapist should go to jail because he raped a woman, uh, and that included uh, parents of rape victims, um, where we had long conversations where they were like, okay, let's say you take this man to jail and what happens to my daughter? Who takes care of her? How is she ever gonna get married? Now that she's gone to, now that you, we go to the, to the justice system and all of our neighbors, everyone knows what we're going through, how do I, how does she have a life afterwards in, in our neighborhood, in our city, etc.? And um, these were not um, aspects that I could solve by doing a film. And so then you have a moral dilemma to, you know, you, you have this cause that you think is right, but you can't fix the whole country. You can't fix the reality uh, of uh, women overnight or by doing a film. Uh, but the idea was to also give that, um, that rationale a voice. It was not to kind of hide it and expose this sort of uh, um, great idea that we're all on the same page. So I included people that were against uh, changing this law for very pragmatic reasons, not because they were awful people. Um, and uh, I contrasted that with, um, with um, uh, other rape victims who actually managed to build a life after rape, who uh, were brave enough to talk about what happened to them um, uncovered, and who, were, who had succeeded in sort of surpassing the, the initial fear of speaking out about what happened, for fear of judgment and for fear of... And having those two discourses together is really something that helped everyone um, see the bigger picture, understand what was really at stake, and make a decision based on, uh, based on that. Um, and it, it's a film that triggered a lot of debate. It's a film that I crowdfunded for the, because I didn't want it, I, I wanted everyone to have a, a stake in it, both in making the film and then in watching the film. And when we, once we posted it on, on YouTube, um, I didn't keep ownership of the film. I wanted as many people to feel free to download it, to see it, and to take the debates around schools and, um, and uh, universities and women's rights associations, et cetera, et cetera. So the way what, was, what worked um, in, the, in sort of talking about this issue is that it wasn't going back to me, the filmmaker, everyone could just use it and talk about it, and so it became everyone's issue. It wasn't just my project, it was a sort of social project that, um, that caught up with everyone. Um, and yeah, and, and, and the law was repealed <laughs> eventually, so um, I guess that's, uh, that's how I know it, it worked. <laughs>
maybe just like a little bit more of information. Were you like a one-woman entity who rocked this all off, or did you have an organization behind you helping you also, for instance, designing the crowdfunding campaign? Um, no, I designed the crowdfunding campaign myself uh, for two reasons. Um, it's Morocco and um, payments online or, uh, is not really common. Um, I was lucky, yeah, because, of, because I lived in London at the time before I decided to make a film. Um, I was able to get, um, to do a crowdfunding campaign, which was the first of its kind in Morocco. Um, and really engage with Moroccans living abroad who could use a credit card and give a little bit of money. Um, and uh, oddly enough, I reached out to a lot of women's association at the time, but because I was unknown and I wasn't part of the, uh, any human rights group, um, they were very suspicious of, uh, of my involvement. Um, and so no, no other women's association wanted to, um, to participate or even speak about this initiative. Um, I mean, there was nothing I could do about that, so I just, I, I emphasized the fact that it was, um, it was for everybody. Um, it was for, for everyone and that we didn't need, we didn't necessarily need one organization or one group of people to, to uh, champion the project. Uh, and Morocco is small enough that it actually worked, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Thank you. Uh, moving on to Shalja. Uh, she is based in Bombay and her official title is Chief Creative with Z Entertainment. Uh, that means she is a commissioning editor and she is also an adventurer, if I may say so. Uh, and in fact, um, with my colleague Minakshi Shadi, who is sitting here as a programmer for the festival, we had um, a conversation in Bombay recently where she told us about a project that actually sparked off the idea for this very panel and I would like to invite Chalja to share with us uh, this amazing project that you have kicked off in your um, uh, Z Entertainment channel. Um, good morning everybody, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Dorothy, uh, Minakshi and I met in Bombay and there was something very interesting. Um, uh, I've grown up in India wherein, you know, even if there is a little bit of extra salt in a dish you're preparing, it's usually said Pakistan. It's, it's usually because of Pakistan. So that's the kind of uh, <laughs> country that I grew up in. Uh, everything, everything is attributed uh, to the neighboring country. If anything goes wrong, it's, you know, because of Pakistan. And it, it's, it's become a joke, actually, you know. Um, and in 2012, uh, I came across a video uh, which was very interesting, which, which, which left a deep impact on me. Um, in 1985, uh, under the Zia ul Haq regime in uh, Pakistan, the sari, the sari, which is a common garment in the, uh, in, in the subcontinent, the sari was banned as a part of Zia's Islamization program. Also, a lot of, uh, you know, poets who were left-wing poets like Faiz Ahmed Faiz were banned. And I saw this amazing singer called Iqbal Banu, who went into a Lahore stadium, which was packed with 50,000 people, wearing a black sari and singing the poems of Faiz Ahmed Faiz, looking directly as a, as, as, as a mark of, uh, you know, uh, uh, challenge thrown to uh, the regime at that time. And the 50,000 crowd sang along with her more importantly, that was my first visual, that was my first visual of Pakistan. And that really amazed me that I had never, or nobody in India had ever had a visual reference of Pakistan, which was so amazing in terms of our media has blocked any, any visual reference uh, that we could have of Pakistan apart from uh, the, you know, the, uh, the prevalent images which were in the news channels in terms of, you know, uh, uh, border uh, skirmishes and so on and so forth. And uh, it, it was a country which was 30 kilometers away, which was a part of our conversation on a daily level, yet we had no visual reference of a country so close by. Um, 
that also made me understand that there was only one kind of a discourse between the two countries and that was the political discourse. Uh, having been in television uh, and having been a commissioning editor and a programmer for many years, um, I started uh, looking at a lot of other uh, such videos and came across a lot of content from Pakistan uh, which sort of started this whole idea of why don't I try and put Pakistan into Indian homes and then let's see whether an alternate discourse starts. That was the most, uh, that, was, that was a crazy idea and at, and at, at the time that it uh, sort of, you know, I was, I was working on it, people thought it was insane and it could never happen. But fortunately, you know, I approached a lot of people and having worked in television for a while, uh, people sort of didn't look at me as suspiciously and thought that maybe there's some, some value to this idea. Possibly because I also, you know, uh, explained the value behind the idea in terms of the monetary value behind the idea. But uh, so, uh, and that then started the project which was called Zindagi. And it was a whole channel full of only Pakistani content, which were beaming, which was beaming into um, 137 million homes uh, in India. So Pakistan was brought into the drawing room of every Indian. And I believe in the last two years, you know, the, the Pakistani stars, the Pakistani actors became superstars in India overnight. Um, there was so much of other conversation about Pakistani poetry now instead of hatred. There was so much conversation about stories, about the way they dress. Somebody even told me, oh my God, they look just like us. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, what were you expecting? But it's a fact. Um, and today I'm so happy, uh, you know, I mean, I wouldn't say that everything has changed, not at all. It's, it's just the start, it's a process. Uh, that was stage one, but which led us to the stage two, which is the project that I'm currently involved in right now. Uh, for the first time, we've managed to produce six films out of Pakistan. An Indian producer producing six films from Pakistan never heard, never heard of before. Uh, it's a country I managed to visit only once. I've been trying for a visa for the last six months and I haven't gotten, been able to get to Pakistan where I can just drive across the border, but I haven't been able to do that. But yes, we've managed to make six films from Pakistan and six films from India. Uh, and I plan to roll out those films next year, uh, you know, in 2016. Uh, the films were all made uh, on WhatsApp and Skype and uh, all the conversation and everything was, you know, on WhatsApp and Skype, but uh, it's a project where uh, 12 directors have come together. Uh, they've all told stories <coughs> because they are storytellers and um, it's, it's a new discourse that's starting uh, in India and I'm very proud that me and my team, you know, were able to uh, start something of this kind. Thank you very much, uh, Shalja. I'm sure we will get back. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Into. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Into the idea of um, TV and how it. Um, <coughs> how a, a feature filmmaking can also be a very important aspect of what we are talking about. Um, to cover the full range, we've had nutrition, we have women's issues, we had Pakistan, India, world conflict uh, issues. I'm turning to Andy Whitaker, who is the, the CEO of Dog Wolf in UK, and he is a distributor for for documentaries that promote social change and to cover the variety, what is missing here are animals. So I would like to invite Andy to give us your background using the example of the famous whale story that you're involved in. Okay, so yeah, so we, <coughs> we've been working for 12 years now distributing films or documentaries, UK and around the world, but Blackfish yeah, let's, let's talk about that. So two years ago, we were at Sundance Film Festival, and this is where we saw Blackfish the first time. What it's, what it's interesting about this, so it's about the issues of you know, animal rights, essentially, but it's a really good story. It follows a killer whale, Tilika, who's at SeaWorld, and you know, very famous. But there was an incident around the death of a trainer. What the film looks at very well is 
you know, how this, what led up to this and why it happened, and then also what followed on, and you know, what did SeaWorld do about it, and, you know, and looking at you know, the history of how the whale got to be there, and those issues, but it treats it very much as a film, and you know, almost like a th thrill, not quite a thriller, but you know, it is much more of a film and a story, and a human story, than being pure about rights and animal rights. But the film, I mean, the budget was about, I think it's about 100,000, but it's certainly not a big budget film. And we've released that in cinemas, DVD, online, and also TV. But what we worked very strongly, so it's very clear that the social issue and the change was going to be a very important part of this. I mean, the, fil the film was made over a million dollars box office. So one of the KPIs is that commercial success, which is great. But the impact it's had is huge. And a lot of people, so we worked very well with um, NGOs and charities and people like PETA for animal rights to, you know, and what they pushed a lot was, was that issue, but they had, the, they had that reach, that community of people who were interested in this story. So that was a great way of getting that first round of audience interested. And then for us, what we were doing was amplifying that to you know, the general public, and that's how you get the big box office. But what started to be interesting, because it's, you know, it's just another social issue film, but what, ha what the impact was against SeaWorld was that after a while, when the film came out, was... Uh, acts like Willie Nelson, the country and western singer, they, they, were, pl they were due to play at SeaWorld and they started cancelling, so they stopped singing at SeaWorld and things like this started to get in the news and other acts followed and you know, people at heart and you know, all sorts of people you would not associate, associate with social issue at all and what that did, I mean it creates the news, CNN pick it up and BBC pick it up, but it, it starts to hit home and also kids in particular, and this is the thing that we hadn't quite thought of originally, but it's the kids, you know, so when the parents take, where should we go on holiday, you know, it's Disney or SeaWorld and all the kids, you know, not SeaWorld, will go to Disney and it was because, you know, essentially because of Blackfish. And these, it's like little moments like that that had a massive effect. And then One Direction, in the middle of a concert, you know, literally said about, don't go to SeaWorld, literally, very short sentence. But the impact of that, and then as you dig in, and sea, SeaWorld never, they were always on the defensive and always in denial. And in some ways, I mean, there's reasons why they do that, but <clears throat> what it meant was that we as a campaign could just keep pushing it and you know, pushing this issue. and. The key thing was the, you know, the facts in the end, and this is very important for filmmakers because CNN, BBC will make you check those facts because if you're going to put a, a big film on, and I think you know, Fed Up is probably another one where you know, make sure you have your facts correct because you know, they will get grilled and it will, you will get asked about it. But if you have them correct, it's great because when people like SeaWorld come on the TV and accuse you of something, you know, that argument is, you know, essentially you want that argument because that's your platform for making it. But essentially, I mean, we'll, we'll keep talking about it, but I mean, the difference this film made, like the reach, as you say, it's millions of people who are aware of this film and you know, millions of people have now watched this film. And it, what's the beautiful thing about it is it's, it is actually driving change. So you know, SeaWorld has started to change their strategy and there has been announcements, but also other you know, people like Disney. Oh, uh, Pixar, Pixar, the Finding Nemo film, uh, Finding Dory. So they actually have rewritten the film based on how they were having some of the characters. So basically making it more sort of, you know, well, I would just say, so not anti sea world, that'd be wrong, but uh, you're more pro how animals are treated. And it's just these subtle things because that does have an impact. And again, it's that sort of children and youth where the change is going to really you know, come through. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, if I put myself in maybe some of your shoes, being maybe a filmmaker, at the very beginning of setting up a new project, all this sounds very motivating, so this is where you can go to if everything goes right. Um, I have a question that relates to that, because it's a different thing when you start out something and you listen to something that went so perfectly, smoothly, well, and all kind of success. What is your stake on saying, well, if I want to go somewhere where I want my film to have an impact, to change something, and I put it opposite to what 
the examples that we've heard here, which are rather complex stories, which are difficult also to convey to mass audiences, and we put on the other side something like the Ice Bucket Challenge. Uh, and I hope I'm not stepping on anyone toes, anyone's toes, but I think it's basically, you know, I was never clear what, you know, this 20 seconds of me putting some water on top of my head has to do with the issue that the film was about. One of the messages that some people say we learned from the Ice Bucket Challenge is to simplify. Now, as a filmmaker, if you want to make a documentary about something like maybe Hint's, uh, Hint's film, for instance, is very, very complex. What is your stake on that? Do you need to simplify things? First of all, if you want to get the message across, what is your point of view, uh, maybe also with examples that you could use in sharing? I have one example I can use. It's not fed up. That's both we simplify the message and also use social media to sim simplify a message and also create a complex space uh, for story sharing, both in the same film. So for the film, it was called Bully, and it was about bullying and the bullying epidemic in the US. And so we had a very specific message that we reiterated over and over and over again. It was uh, 13 million kids uh, were bullied every year. And that's a very simple message and a shocking statistic. And we made sure every influencer, every partner, every celebrity had that message. And we keyed it up before opening weekend because we cared about box office sales and awareness, the film doing well, that that was the message everybody pushed on one particular day. So everybody saw that message and got on board and we made it a splash and broke through all the noise online. So that was important for us because that was like big awareness for the film with a simple message uh, on social media. On the flip side, we found that the greatest impact we had with that film was creating a safe space online for kids and actually adults who were still suffering from PTSD from being bullied to share their story. And so for months leading up to the film and after the film, we had like a 24-hour watch on our social media where people would post stories, would email us, would tweet at us, and we made sure we had somebody who could respond with, with resources, with help, or just like a, hey, I hear you. And so just by sharing these stories and just by kind of feeling okay that it was okay to say you were bullied, we felt um, that people, we kind of removed the stigma of being bullied. And so for us, that was a huge step in the campaign that we didn't think we were gonna go in that direction. We thought we would be more legislative or would be about changing school policy but we found people just wanted to talk about it and they wanted to feel okay talking about it and so creating that space online um, was a big part of the campaign for us. I don't know if that answers your social media question. Mm. Yeah, yeah we, we did Food Inc. and also a film called End of the Line and that's about sustainable fishing. In fact, both of those, because you know, it's very easy to say I know, X is bad and Y is good and you know, it's very hard to change people or you, you should not, you should be, actually Food Inc is interesting because people think you should become a vegetarian but actually what the principles it talks about are more where does your food come from and actually if you look at today's world like farm fresh, local goods, local farmers and less chemicals and actually that's more the message of the film but you know, coming, coming back to your question the great thing there is you know, what's the action you know, can I change big food companies you know, probably not but actually as a consumer if everybody just you know, buys you know, organic foods is the classic but even just making small changes of the type like, like buying food from local farmers actually that's a huge change and actually if people start doing that the big companies will actually change their behavior because you know, if people are buying something they will change their behavior to meet that need mm -hmm. um, there is this this line that came up in different wordings yesterday, also in our meeting, it's like, you know, you have the social awareness, you have the impact or education, and you have the change or engagement, like the three steps. And I wonder if you apply this to what we are talking about as a strategy. Is it that, like, the complexity is in the film and the simplification is in the related strategies? If you could... Uh, Elaborate on that, Shalda, if you... Um, yeah, uh, <coughs> see, uh, taking from your Ice Bucket Challenge, for example, and many such uh, social awareness, uh, you know, uh, uh, social media uh, uh, insight, uh, I, I feel that uh, there can be a messaging, but mm -hmm. for it to have a long-lasting impact, complexities need to be uh, explored much more. Um, for example, uh, in India, uh, in 1929, there was a bill called the Sharada Act, which was passed, which was anti-child marriage. 
Since then, there have been many social campaigns, social media campaigns also about uh, being anti-child marriage. But, I mean, th there was messaging, of course, you know. There was also an impact, but I don't know whether it led to any kind of, any kind of social change. On the other hand, there's a, a television program called Balika Vadhu, which has been running now for almost three years, uh, that deals with the uh, complex issue of child marriage. Why does it happen? How does it happen? And the various points of view, like you know, Hind mentioned in her films, people who were pro it, people who were against it, uh, the girl, the man in question, and the families, etc. <coughs> that. I believe has led to a far greater impact and change because it deals with multiple layers, you know, of, of the problem rather than, okay, let's be against this, you know, or let's do this. Because that can, that does not sort of, you know, go down well with different, uh, you know, uh, kinds of people. You might be pro it or against it, but if you deal with all the complexities and all the layers, I believe that the impact and therefore leading to change can be far greater. Okay, maybe let's stay for this ch with this child marriage issue for a moment. Let's say there is a filmmaker, maybe in India, maybe in Pakistan, Sri Lanka, elsewhere, saying, well, I'm very much against this, I want to make a film about this. And suddenly a filmmaker finds, oh, I'm very much on one page with, let's say, UNICEF. Yeah? Now, UNICEF is a very, very potent foundation, has a lot of money, so when would you think with your background and experience, maybe Hint has also uh, experiences in this, in this respect, when is a good moment to approach a media person and how do you go on your own or do you wait until Christie is on board? What is your experience on that? Well, I can speak to that one. Actually, we just did a film about child marriage uh, and it's okay. a narrative film called Defret. Um, it's a film that takes place in Ethiopia, all in Amharic and Ethiopian cast. Um, and it's, it's a narrative film, but usually, so you, you know what the film is, you know what the script is, you kind of know what you're gonna get at the end. With documentary, you're not quite sure that story could change throughout the four years you're shooting. So for us, we don't like to, to bring in a partner or in an organization until we have something we can actually show them. We found if you so, show something too early, the film may change and you have to show it to them again. These are, these are organizations that, have, that are working on very big issues that are very busy on very low budgets. And so you don't want to waste their time. Uh, so usually we wait until we have something that we can show um, that they can watch all the way through and come on board with. So for the film Defret, we worked with uh, Equality Now, we worked with UNICEF, um, we worked with um, like all the, the feminist organizations we worked with, but we worked with three main organizations to develop uh, a petition on change.org where they really led the writing of the petition um, targeting the State Department and we then used the film and changed and our partnership with change.org to do the outreach and awareness and collect the 200,000 petition signatures we wanted and then with those three organizations did a screening at the State Department, a delivery of the petition and got the State Department to make a commitment to deliver a strategy regarding adolescent girls and child marriage internationally before the end of this year. So, but that all happened within the last uh, seven months and it was only once we had a film that was finished that we could then go to these organizations. Yeah, um, I think it should be on. Yeah. Yes, um, talking about <coughs> sort of my own experience with Break the Silence, um, my initial fail to get um, Women's Association on board, which I thought was gonna kill my film, actually turned out to be a blessing somehow because uh, I had to think creatively about, you know, how do I get my message and which target group do I, do I go to? And oddly enough, um, to take this question out of um, the activist circle and into sort of um, other platforms that uh, did not usually deal with that, like tabloids, like um, women's fashion magazine and things like that, once we got the message there, and once, um, I'm, when I reached out to journalists that felt that the, the, the problem was relevant in those platforms, um, we had a lot more impact. And you could see it immediately through likes, through tweets, um, and, and through shares of the story. So um, we, the way we did it is that we kept um, very simple messages on uh, social media again, because you want to create, once, when you look at your news feed, um, and you usually have, I don't know, two seconds per feed, you don't want long sentences, or you don't want to, explore, to tell the whole story there. You just want something that people feel good about sharing. It's really about that. It's like you need to feel good about talking, talking about it. So you need, either you're shocked or you're touched, uh, but something that 
always goes back to the audience, to the viewer, for them to kind of own your message. And, uh, and, and, and yeah, and targeting uh, fashion bloggers and fashion websites who felt uh, a compassion and a need to talk about this important issue really broadened the specter of people and brought in a lot more people than we would have uh, reached in the closed clubs of human rights group or women's associations at the end of the day. So um, that's also something to consider. So we use the word pivot a lot. <laughs> like, you, okay, this is our direction. We're going this way. We want to work with these human rights orgs. That's not working. Okay, great, pivot. <laughs> like, you, you don't have time <laughs> to, to stick with it and keep hitting the wall. It's not working. So you find something that is, <laughs> which sounds like it's what you did. Yeah, and I think it's, it's fascinating that, and I love that sharing thing. We definitely find if it's shareable. Actually, that's the one. So when I come out of the cinema, the classic question is, what did you think of the film? And if it takes you 10 minutes to explain about the history of Egypt, that's not very shareable. If you can get across what this film was about in 15 seconds and go, wow, yeah, then you have that. And I think a thread across most of these films, it doesn't have to be feel good, but that fact of you can share it and talk about it and have passion, I think is a key thread. I completely agree. Uh, there's a very interesting case what happened that, um, like I was telling you uh, the other day, that before we launched the channel Zindagi, uh, the, the, uh, all the television channels in India uh, were beaming shows only of the Hindu uh, uh, culture and there was no minority or anything, uh, there were no Christians, there were no uh, Muslim characters, there were no Jew char Jewish characters. in and wherein we know that India is such a multicultural, pluralistic society. Um, what happened was very interesting, which happened on its own, you know, once uh, Zindagi came in, Zindagi has been on air for the last one year. Uh, apart from Pakistan coming into Hindu, uh, Indian homes, the Muslim culture also came into uh, Indian homes, and that automatically sparked a uh, social uh, media campaign, which was done by a very, uh, you know, very uh, an ad film uh, gentleman called Ram, uh, and he started a post-it campaign, you know, which was I'm a Muslim, I'm from Mumbai, and I don't hate Pakistan, you know, uh, I, I'm a Hindu, I'm from uh, Banaras, and I don't hate uh, Pakistan. Uh, and the same thing, it, it just became viral and it started in Pakistan as well. I mean, we got so many uh, people from uh, Pakistan saying, you know, I am so-and-so and I am from Islamabad and I don't hate India. And that became viral and today it has more than 30 million, uh, of, of, you know, people who've posted on their side. So sometimes, you know, your message can, you know, be amplified. Your message can be amplified by social media and that's a good thing, you know. I mean, I don't know whether only that would have probably work, but the combination of both is uh, what is probably important. So that amplifies. So, I mean, a key thing of what we do is the theatrical or cinema release. And I think, again, that touches on here. So I think it's good to get your partners on board or the charities, the helpers on board during while, while you're making the film. But I think the key is, it's once it's made, so the festival premiere or the cinema release, because that's like a point in time that everybody can get on board and, and amplify yeah. that message. And I think the beauty of that is, you know, it's a very clear timing and a point that you can all aim at and everybody can get on board for. Whereas, you know, trying to keep that going for three years of making a film, is just, it's just so hard and, and so diffuse. I mean, that's one of the great things about working in the film, right? It's otherwise we would just all be working on nonprofits on these issues if we're doing three-year campaigns. It's the film has this opportunity to, to create a tipping point in the movement, to capture everyone's attention, to be a, a thunderclap. And that's, you know, how do you, what, you know, create that moment both in theatrical or your DVD or your Netflix or whatever that is and get people to rally around that point. It's kind of the, the difference between, you know, working on a film and just kind of working on the issue. So trying to sum up a little bit in between of what you've been saying, it sounds like to me that where we are today in 2015, you're saying, well, take your time, whether you make a documentary or a, docu uh, a feature film, if you want to create social awareness, take your time to develop under a certain kind of a lab situation, which is not like exposing, you know, uh, what is happening in this scene and that scene already with reflection on your social media campaign. Have a product ready, if we talk about a film as a product. Then bring it and use everything else 
only afterwards, for instance, at the crucial moment of a festival. Is that uh, summing up in a way what would be all your experience? Is this a one and only formula or have you also had experiences where like from the very beginning you start working with your company, with Dogwolf or maybe you with a TV station and I don't know how you would see this maybe in prospect of your next film when you start actually looking for the partners and where do you find the right partners? I would say actually it's maybe before that is figuring out your role in this. Like for you, you were, this is a two-year commitment I'm assuming for you. You're in it not just to release a film but to really make sure you see change happen all the way through and you're actively involved in it. So I think it's being really honest with yourself as a filmmaker what you want your role to be. Are you doing this as a film, as a piece of cinema or journalism and you're going to move on to your next project or are you willing and, and you want to put in that time and energy to do all this work that either like my company would normally do or maybe working with a distributor would do. Um, figure out what your role is. Are you the activist or the filmmaker and you're moving on to the next project and there's there's no right or wrong answer in that it's just being very honest with yourself and your partners and what your role is in my case I uh, wasn't going to have a festival release um, so working out how to get the message across when uh, I was going to publish a 48 minute long video on, on internet was very crucial and I had to build an audience from the very start. From the moment I did the crowdfunding campaign, I had to keep the supporters of the campaign on board and I had to build an audience from then on. And um, I did that by um, doing, um, releasing once a week, just a one minute video um, that was, had talked about the topic uh, but was not extracts of the film. Um, and that worked quite well in kind of generating more and more uh, people who were interested in it. And um, the other thing I did right before um, I was going to post it online is that I uh, organized a screening uh, for journalists. Half of them didn't show up, uh, but the other half uh, who came uh, were write, wrote something about it uh, the, the next day and the day after, and that also helped push visibility um, to the video online. And uh, it's actually through uh, the web release that commissioning editors from Morocco, from the region, from Europe and the United States started contacting me to be able to show the film. Um, so it was kind of like a reverse experience. Um, I wouldn't, I would say, um, it, it's a great story to tell, but it's very, very hard psychologically. Um, and the more people you have around you to do that, the better. Um, doing this, building this campaign uh, and doing a film and trying to talk about it. I had like an average of four hours sleep for about six months and uh, there are many points where I just was completely burnt out. So I think the more people you have around you, the, the, the better. Um, there were occasions where I had to miss uh, uh, going somewhere to talk about it because I was literally, I couldn't get out of bed. So. <laughs> Don't do so, yeah, surround yourself with uh, people you trust and who can also carry this message um, so that you don't completely kill yourself doing, <laughs> trying to do something um, is uh, another advice I would give. So, so I think uh, some of what we heard in terms of experiences is maybe applicable to where you are or what you might want to know. I'm just realizing that uh, time is running very fast, so I would like to invite you, if you have specific questions, if, if you would like to know of experiences, if you need tricks, uh, if you have a very unique situation, please ask our experts, um, or otherwise we are very happy to continue chatting here. I mean, we, please, yes. <clears throat> please wait for the microphone. Thanks. Hi, I'm Sonia Kriplani, and I'm a filmmaker from here, but an Indian filmmaker. And my current film is on death row in UAE and was shot on death row and in the prisons of UAE. Ironically, I got great, great support here. Not a single film, and Diff also was a big support. Nobody cut the film, nobody edited the film. It was great. Where I got the worst grief was India. And part of it was because of the media. The media wouldn't help. The media wouldn't help because they're paid media. They say, show me the money. Every channel, including Z, said, show me the money. Until it became Punjab elections, 
when it made sense for them to pick up the fact that there were 17 Sikhs on death row, they wouldn't show up a frame without paying the money. And integrally, if you're a filmmaker who wants to make change, you won't pay money for anybody. Mm -hmm. How can we change that framework with people like you in, in this framework? We need to change it. Can you imagine when there are 200 more Indians in death row? Thanks to the campaign year, thanks to, to all the reporters here, we were able to get the first Indian girl on death row off. We managed, we've got amnesty in, we've got human rights in, there's been a lot of governance change here. Finally, we managed to take the floor th through amnesty to all the parliament floor, and we've heard Narendra Modi's speech here, where he changed the rule which we were asking for, the first phone call for every labor camp, and that wasn't happening. But had it happened, and it took us four years to get there, to get these people off the, off the death row. But had it been from, for Indian media to even come in this much, we would have, I wouldn't have been beaten at National Airport, for starters. How can we, as media, as change makers, make this change in India? Uh, first of all, congratulations you. for you know, uh, your uh, extremely courageous uh, uh, film and effort. Uh, the thing is that, you know, uh, there is there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of and that's what uh, that's what I was talking about. I mean, being from the Indian media myself, there is a lot of clamping down on what you can show and what you can't show. Uh, and yes, one has to find uh, methods of you know breaking through that definitely. Uh, and it is it is a pretty uh, oppressive situation at this point in time. Uh, but I I I believe that uh, you know uh, on mainstream media it. It does become difficult, uh, but I think now uh, there is, like, like she said, that you know she released a film on YouTube and uh, so on and so forth. On mainstream media, it is a problem. It is, um, but I guess you know um, when you when you talk to the editors or when you sort of, uh, it really depends. You know, like uh, Shekhar Kapoor. I was talking to Shekhar Kapoor the other day, and he said it really depends on the conscience, you know, of uh, a person. It's not an organizational thing beyond a point, you know, and that is what one needs to appeal to. So like for example, I, I took my project as an independent person to a media house, right? And it, and it appealed to the conscience of the owner of the uh, media baron to allow me to do this, you know? And I guess that it, it can only come through dialogue, that's all, you know? And another question was for Andy. See, Andy, one of the reasons this project got made was Good Pitch and Bertha. How important it is for, people, uh, for us in this region, especially in this region where there's such a conundrum of issues, to bring in a Bertha and a, a good pitch. What would, what would you say? I mean, something with, like with DIF, how could Bertha and DIF, or any other local organization partner, so yeah. filmmakers like me who are, who are fighting for change in a region like this? I think, I think per organizations you know, and like Bertha, and they're also working with people like ITFA, yeah, the, uh, the festival in Holland. Right. So they I think they are really important and it is and it is interesting. So for example, yeah, well, we're we're a business. But people like yeah, what they're very good at is and, and actually for you know, for everybody here, getting bits of money, you know, like I don't know, from Tribeca or, you know, Doha or Dubai is quite is I'm not sure it's easy, but it's certainly doable. But kicking on and who are the people to speak to. So I think the brilliant brilliant thing people like Bertha do and Brit Dog is, you know, knowing who these, having these contacts. So A, there is the financial benefit, but I think the big one is they, as you, as you say, the, you know, good pitch and it for Bertha, is getting the right, the right people in the room, <laughs> yeah, and also telling you, actually, great, great story, have you spoken to these people? And I think facilitating that, you know, is, is a great thing that they do, and, you know, it's definitely something that people, especially when the project's in development and early on, because that answers your question about that timing, I think they're very good, you know, to go to. Yes. Yeah, getting yeah, actually it's a good question, but getting getting cash early can be dangerous because let's say if you're the BBC or CNN, you do not want to be you know, branded content essentially. You don't want to touch that because you need that neutrality. So exactly, but what you are looking for is that support. Yeah. I, I would like to to take your um, your remarks to, to ask Christy first to share with us 
what you told us yesterday, there is a new device uh, by BritDoc that might be very useful for many of you present yeah. here. So it's, it's called the Impact Field Guide that BritDoc produced. Um, it started out of a, a summit about a year and a half ago of impact producers coming together. And then about, I think it was yesterday actually, yesterday or two days ago, they just updated it. And you probably know it internationalized it, as they said. They worked with filmmakers and impact producers from around the world, where a year and a half ago it was mostly US and UK. So that's a fantastic tool. I think it's impactfieldguide.com. You can probably just Google it. There's another one that I forgot to mention yesterday um, by a, a group called Active Voice, um, and it's called Horticulture, and it very, very oversimplifies you helping figure out what type of film you have by associating it with or comparing it to a gardening tool, uh, and then helps you develop your campaign by with all these gardening metaphors, and it's actually very, very helpful and very useful. <laughs> Um, and another thing that you were bringing up is this um, thing that, you know, when we decided on topics that we wanted to talk about, uh, I, I used the very non-sexy word legal issues. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, maybe easier to translate into, you know, as a filmmaker, when you're touching very, very relevant issues, uh, sometimes you feel as a filmmaker like the David against Goliath. So legal things are extremely important, especially in uh, documentary filmmaking. So what is your stake on that? Where, where, at what point in the concept of developing a film do you need to actually see a lawyer or have this kind of backing that you apparently got at a very early stage? I didn't get it at an early stage. I only realized yeah. Brit Dog. I found out about okay. Yeah, maybe, you. maybe you can have yeah. an example also to make it... Um... Oh, there's, pl there's plenty of examples, although it's always hard to talk about them. But um, let's talk about the conversation you do not want to have. <laughs> uh, so first of all, have good insurance. That's always quite nice. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know, so there's a thing. So therefore, but the conversation, therefore, you do not want to have is this. So as a, you know, as dog wolf, I get you this great deal. The big TV network wants the film, and it could be a HBO, a BBC, a Netflix, but they have big lawyers too, and those, you know, the target of your film, you know, also have lawyers, so they will ask, you know, okay, you know, again, it comes back to, is, is the facts, the research, can you back it up? And, you know, and they are looking for that assurance. So if you go, well, yeah, what, like, while you're making the film, it's quite easy to sort of cut corners, and clearly you've got that passion, and that's fine, but when the film's made and getting out to that public, it, it, it will come back. And yeah, the definite, there definitely are examples in documentary where some very big companies you know, have got some lawyers and, and they come, cha well, they come chasing me, but they also come chasing the filmmakers. But I think, again, if, you, if, you're, if you're confident and you have done that research, I think yeah, you, you can work through that. I don't know, uh, you must have had issues, like uh, that is not exactly a non-sensitive territory you're dealing with, with the, Z the Zindagi channel. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I mean, uh, as uh, Andy said, that uh, uh, having a good lawyer, doing your research properly um, is really important. I mean, even before uh, we started making the films that we did with India and Pakistan, as well as uh, launching the channel and so on, uh, what we, what I actually ended up doing was with the legal team, you know, uh, fortunately because a uh, 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 broadcaster was backing my project, uh, we did have, but even then, even as a broadcaster, there were many legal issues to think about because it wasn't the easiest thing to basically do. And yes, we consulted a lawyer before, an, a battery of lawyers actually, you know, before we put uh, this stuff out. Uh, and. As, as, as uh, Andy was saying, I mean, the research, the facts are the most important thing, you know. Do, do you want to give us, uh, sorry, Hint, you, you were saying something. Um, no, um, so I had no money to get any lawyers. And <laughs> in my film, um, there is a member of parliament who uh, was accused of rape in Morocco. Um, and I followed um, the victim and the lawyer of the member of parliament. Uh, and both of them gave their, their point of view of um, what was going on. Um, and by releasing this film online, I, you know, it was a very big risk. 
Um, but um, the way, uh, yeah, checking your facts is vital. Um, and working with uh, rape victims at first, I was very um, sort of naive and quite reluctant to ask the question of, can I see your paper trials? Can I see the proof of this? Can I see the proof of that? It's just not a very, it's not the, the time and place to, to do that. But once our, once our relationship grew, I had to look into uh, those paper trials. Uh, and a lot of the times uh, I was confronted with the fact that these women who have been um, hurt were also using the film and therefore lying about some of the things that they had said to the camera. Um, and uh, these are simply, how, however beautiful they were and however touching they were, I had to cut these bits out of the film, mm. uh, fair and square. Um, so, um, you, yeah, do check your facts. Um, and, uh, the, and what saved me against the Member of Parliament is because all the facts were correct. And if he wanted to come after me, he had uh, his lawyer talk on the camera, so I presented both arguments. And, 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 and everything I could back with, with legal documents. Um, and that's, that's vital. Don't underestimate that at any stage. Yes, please. Hi, good morning. Um, Hind, I, I really relate <laughs> to your story. I've spent, uh, just very in a nutshell, I spent four years um, making a film in Jordan about the anti-nuclear energy campaign. And it started off with an intention from an environmental perspective. I didn't realize at the time what I'd find out along the way. And to put it in a nutshell, it's one of the biggest um, corruption cases that are in Jordan. <laughs> um, and I, like you, got completely burnt out. It affected my health. It, uh, I had limited budgets. I put my own money into this film. And it's reached the stage right now where I have a two-hour film, um, but I have no funds for... Uh, um, going back and checking all the facts and uh, getting a good editor on my side. I tried an editor in Belgium for nine days, but it wasn't really fair because the language barrier, the film is in Arabic. Um, so I'm at the stage where the film is on the shelf now. I've got a fantastic case. It really embarrasses one of the top um, powerful people in Jordan. It rocks the boat about embarrassing the, the government of how badly they've managed their energy file. It's, uh, it's a film that would really get me into, into a lot of trouble, but I have a good case because I really dug deep and I got, I managed, it took me a year to get the, the loyalty and the trust of four people who were actually in the nuclear energy campaign, who were, uh, and not to the campaign, the nuclear energy, you know, um, commission that were kicked out because they had a conscience and they realized later on what was going on. And I have their information. So I've reached a point where I have a two-hour film of such an amazing argument, but I don't have a proper uh, producer to really take the courage to take this film forward. Um, but this film, if it came out, would really make Jordanians aware of the details. Um, you know, the, the country is, I could, you know, I don't want to go on too much about it, but the country is bankrupt and it's uh, lying to its people for the past eight years since the energy commission, nuclear energy commission started. Um, Jordan has no capability of making nuclear energy because there's no water, there's no money, there's no infrastructure, and yet they're lying to the country about this stupid project that doesn't make any sense. So I have this film, and everybody's wondering when it's going to come out, but I can't put myself under, you know, under legal... Um... <sighs> Do you know what I mean? I need proper, like, lawyers, I need... Because it's such a strong case, and I can't forget about it. Believe me, often I've thought of that idea. Yeah. But it's, um, it's a big embarrassment, uh, and it's a fantastic film. So how did you manage in terms of uh, finding the right people to work with, finding the funds for such an important issue that you made? So I had crowdfunded it, um, and this is, this is how I got the funds to do it. Um, it was badly budgeted, so um, <laughs> I was completely broke afterwards. But, 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 um, reach out for help. Uh, the people who helped me the most um, um, were, you know, the commissioning editors that uh, decided to, uh, to, to air it. Um, uh, they were of great help to help me through also the legal process to also make sure with me that all, the, all these documents had gathered from 
the victim from the lawyer were correct. Um, um, I also, uh, through foreign journalists who um, had seen the film online uh, and wrote about the film, um, I reached out to them too um, to be able to organize screenings or find out information about um, how to deal with those, um, how to spread the word abroad as well and make sure we had um, enough international, an international eye on Morocco for once uh, that could make uh, legislators uh, debate the law. So at, at, every, at every stage of your film, there's always um, a lot of people sometimes that you don't suspect that could be of great help. And part of it is uh, to look them in the eye and ask for help. Uh, be very specific about what you need, what you want, and uh, from that you'll find the network of people that are willing to have a look at your film, uh, uh, critique it, and direct you to the right persons. Um, and I think don't be, don't be shy about that and uh, uh, figure out exactly what you need at this time and point uh, and reach out to people to connect you or to help you go through these, these, um, these steps. Don't do it alone. I don't know if anyone... Well, that was really good advice. No. Yeah, I think it... Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and sometimes also uh, it, it helped, this was brought up by some of you in the beginning, sometimes it, it helps to have kind of... Uh, well, I'm not even sure if I would call it uh, a celebrity only, but someone who would become a patron. Uh, and I wonder uh, if you would share that in particular cases, especially when it's very difficult, like in your case, to, to look like who have I heard speaking mm -hmm. about the issue that uh, I could refer to or I could see potentially that this person might become a door opener. I don't know if you agree on this, but in some cases... Uh was a, yeah, we've seen, we're not usually at this stage, but from working with filmmakers, yeah, that's, that's where the hustle is. You look at past films and look at who the producers were, the executive producers, where they got their money from, and you, you find your own connections. As you're asking favors of friends, do you know this person, how do I get to this person? Um, but yeah, look at, look at films that are similar, look at people who worked on it, these issues, look at donors to nonprofits or foundations that are similar, um, and then you, you hustle <laughs> and you try and reach them and you, you find ways to get to them and you have very specific asks and clear asks. And I think that we've seen in some cases there's, you know, there's the salon idea. We've had, you know, if you have that influencer or that patron, they host a salon for you where they show a couple clips of your film or a trailer um, and help fundraise for you at those events and crowdfunding. I mean, you sound like you're in a perfect situation for crowdfunding where you genuinely have that need and it's for very specific things that people can get on board with. Talking about the people in the film? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I bet I can. There are very important going to the table. There are four people in Jordan who are willing to speak up, but they often play with their life. How do we as filmmakers work that balance, and how can we as, as people with conscience secure that balance? That, that's, I mean, it's tough. Again, I'm not a filmmaker, so I, I won't speak to this fully, but that is a very, it's a very, very big issue. And mm -hmm. someone who's going on film has to really be, really have a full understanding. You as a filmmaker have a responsibility of walking them through what they're doing and what that's going to be. Um, I think part of it's talking to other filmmakers. So we've, we haven't worked with whistleblowers on this level, but we've worked with kids in, uh, in low-income situations that are going to be put on the big screen for the first time. So when we took a film to Sundance and we had three kids in the film that were going to become you know, big stars, and had never been out of their city before, we actually hired local therapists. So we had therapists that they could talk to if they had any questions about this. We did another film uh, that was about sexual assault, and so the girls in the film were coming, um, and we hired, again, trauma therapists. So if anybody saw the film and it triggered something, they could talk to the therapist. The girls in the film could talk to a therapist. It's, it's not whistleblowing, it's different, but I think part of it is filmmaker responsibility to prepare them for about what they're about to go through. Um. 
this one says time is almost up. Um, so I think we should wrap up this session. I hope that for those of you who have attended, you got some ideas, some inspiration. It becomes very, very clear to me that you have to be absolutely specific about your topic, about what you want to reach. There is no formula, no recipe that can be applied from one film to another, from one case to another. Um, I would like to thank all the panelists for sharing and for also giving us a very good example of uh, that it is worthwhile to be very courageous in filmmaking. Thank you all very, very much for coming. And if you have more questions, maybe our panelists would be around for a little longer. Thank you all for coming and have a good day at the Dubai International Film Festival. Thank you.